Welcome to worship service at Spring Hill. I'm Kay Matthews, and this is my husband, Ken. Hello. I want to read a scripture for you this morning, and those of you who are football fans have seen people hold up signs that says John 3, 16. So I'm going to read that exact scripture to you if you've never heard it before. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life.
Sunday, everybody. Happy Palm Sunday, in fact. As you guys are probably well aware, this is a very important week in the Christian faith. And today marks the beginning of what we call Holy Week. And so Palm Sunday is very important because today is the day that Jesus arrives in Jerusalem. Knowing his future, he still arrives in Jerusalem. And so what I'm going to do today and what I'm hoping you guys will help me with is I've sent my children on a task. And so I've sent my kids on a little Easter egg hunt. And within each Easter egg contains a piece of the Easter story. And so I'm going to need your all's help putting those items in order of how they take place this week. And so um, join me as my sons find the eggs and then as my daughter helps us put those in order. Now that we've found all the eggs and all the pieces, I'm going to put a photo up for you guys to look at. And let's see, without my help, if you guys can put them in order. And then when we get done with that, my daughter is going to show us how she did it. So now we have Leah. Say what you're putting there so everybody can okay, see. Okay, so Palm Sunday and then the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus was arrested. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking at the things. pictures. Mm -hmm. You have this one and then this one. Wait, I think it's that one, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, so here's where we are. Story of Easter, Palm Sunday. They had the Last Supper. Jesus was arrested, then he was beaten. Then what happened? Uh, I'm trying to look at all these. Okay. Um, I'm look, um, is it, isn't it this one? That's right, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Jesus died on the cross and his friends were very sad. Then what'd they do? And then they put his body into a... Tomb. That's right. Mm -hmm. Two women went to the tomb. They were both named Mary. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. So before the angel can roll away the stone, what has to happen? Okay, so the angel has to come. That angel has to come. That's right. Good. And then, then he rolls away the stone. And then that one. Perfect. Great job. So to wrap up for today, I wanted to read a little scripture for us. I'm going to read Matthew 27 verses 45 through 54. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came all over the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with vinegar, and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out, in a, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So we just heard the final words of Jesus when he was on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So why did Jesus take that trip to Jerusalem? Even though he knew all that was to come the crucifixion, the beatings, the ultimately his death. Um, and I'm sure you guys know the answer to this. And it's because Jesus came to earth to die because he loved us and he came to die for our sin. He took 
our punishment from us, for us, um, in exchange for his cleanliness. And he did this so that we could be with God, um, clean and pure and full of life. Um, Jesus was crucified not because he did anything wrong, but because of what we have done wrong. That's why Jesus took that trip to Jerusalem, ultimately endured all of the pain, the suffering, and his death, because he loves us and he wants us to be with God forever. Thank you guys so much for your time today. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Hello. You may not know this, but there are five ways you can share your stewardship and you can give to Spring Hill. In person, drop by the church Monday, Wednesday, Friday between 9 and 1 online, through the giving link on our church website, through the mail to Spring Hills Street Address, using pay bill through your bank account, or through the Uversion app on your smartphone. And now, share a prayer with me. Let us pray. Dear God, teach us to be good stewards of our income and our gifts and our talents that we can share with Spring Hill so that Spring Hill can share locally and with the, the world. Please bless the tithes and offerings, Lord, that we can use them to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey everyone, this is Mike Alley, Associate Pastor here at Spring Hill Baptist Church. I hope you and your family are doing well. Before we get into the message this morning, please let us know how we can help you, a family member, a neighbor, someone in the community. Just call our office and we will do our very best. This morning, we're going to continue our sermon series entitled, A Journey with Jesus to the Resurrection. And the theme this morning is the ultimate sacrifice. One of the major changes in watching events on television, your iPad, your laptop, or your cell phone is that you can see things from several different angles. In athletics, when an important play happens, you're shown the play from several different views. 
You can watch the play from the sidelines, on the field, over the field, and from the perspective of an athlete wearing a body cam. There's an instant replay where a good play can be highlighted or a call is challenged. However, you can watch not only the event, but you can see the various reactions of the athletes, fans and family in the stands, opponents, coaches, and even sometimes the faces of those back at home. These different angles give us a better feel and perspective of what actually happened. The events during the last hours of the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ, come in rapid succession. Here's a quick timeline, let's say cliff notes. It begins on a Thursday evening around 6 p.m. when Jesus has a simple Passover meal. We call it the Last Supper with his disciples. Late in the evening around 10 p.m., the disciples and Jesus head to the Garden of Gethsemane. When they cross over into the garden, Jesus tells the disciples to pray, and he goes further into the walled garden with Peter, James, and John. He asks them to keep watch with him. Then at 11 p.m., Jesus goes a little further and falls to the ground and prays with an intensity that cannot be imagined. During this time, Jesus faces the harsh reality of what's going to take place and seeks the Lord's strength while the disciples sleep. Everyone is awakened around 2 a.m. when a group of soldiers led by Judas comes to arrest Jesus. They bind him and take him to his first trial. First at Annas' residence, he was the previous high priest. Then to Caiaphas' resident, the current high priest. Now it's early daybreak, 5 or 6 a.m., the first light of dawn in the sky. Following the trial, the rooster crows at Peter's third denial, and Jesus turns and looks at him. Jesus is now being taken to Pilate's praetorium. Pilate's wife, having been warned in a dream, tells Pilate to have nothing to do with that just man. And Pilate knows he's being handed over to him through envy. Pilate, hearing he is from Galilee, sends Jesus to Herod's residence. Herod's men mock and tease Jesus. Herod questions him considerably, but gets no answers. Pilate offers Jesus or Barabbas, a rebel and murderer, to the people. Choose one or the other for release. When they ask for it to be Barabbas, Pilate has Jesus stripped and whipped. Pilate's soldiers place a wreath of thorns on him, and robing him in purple, blindfold him, punch him and beat him with a rod. Pilate brings Jesus out, severely marred now, to the crowd a second time. The second time, Pilate is told how Jesus declares himself to be the Son of God. Where are you from, he asks Jesus inside the praetorium. You don't answer. Don't you see I have the authority to crucify you or to free you? Jesus replies, you hold no authority over me except that given you from above. Therefore, he who gave me over to you holds the greater sin. Pilate is now more alarmed than ever and wants to free him but cannot get the people's approval. Around 6 a.m., this is the third time Pilate has gone out to the people, according to Luke. Pilate is unable to get the people to acknowledge that Jesus should be released. They take the purple robe off Jesus put his own robe back on him temporarily and lead him outside the walls north of the city bearing his cross. On the hill of Golgotha, the skull, he is nailed to the cross. 9 a.m., crucifixion starts. Now, I'm not sure how well you followed that timeline, but within a seven-hour period, Jesus goes from arrest to execution. He is sentenced to death in a matter of hours. It is obvious to anyone that Jesus is being railroaded, but he endures. These things all happen so quickly that it's easy for us to miss the impact of each event. Last Sunday, Pastor Steve gave us a view of the two criminals hanging next to Jesus, one on the right and one on the left. One chose Christ and the other did not. 
like the two criminals, we need to choose. Today, I want to replay one more moment found in Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 49. Luke describes the same moment as seen from several different perspectives. So let's go to Luke. By this time, it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone. And suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down in the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshiped God and said, surely this man was innocent. And when all the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw what had happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching. When I was around seven or eight years old, I remember throwing football with a friend in his backyard. I was halfway around our neighborhood when I noticed the trees started to bend from the wind and the sky grew very dark. I ran home as fast as I could and slammed the door. Anytime there was a thunderstorm, my mom would have us sit down and be quiet. I'm not sure why, but I did as I was told. I remember peeking out the window and seeing the awning off the the back door ripped off. A tornado had touched down near our home. It's kind of creepy and scary when it gets dark as a thunderstorm is approaching but I cannot imagine what it would have been like to be in the dark, absolute darkness, for three hours in the middle of the day. It must have been obvious that something ominous was taking place. The sense of judgment was very evident. Jesus is on the cross, and Luke tells us it's in the middle of the day, the brightest part of the day, and the sky turns dark. Now, this isn't a solar eclipse. God does something miraculous and causes the sun to go down for about three hours. It's so significant that everybody who's watching these events unfold know immediately that this is not a coincidence. Even if it were a solar eclipse, the the timing of this could not be coincidental. God makes the light of the sun disappear, and the people both physically and spiritually are in the dark. For three hours. William Barclay says this, it is if the sun itself could not bear to look upon the deed man's hands had done. Now our next view is a close-up of the temple curtain. Luke tells us that when Jesus died, the curtain in the temple tore in two. Matthew tells us the curtain tore in two from top to bottom. This means that no individual tore this curtain. Theologian R.C. Sproul tells us, this was an amazing event, both physically and in its spiritual meaning. The curtain covered the golden doors that led into the Holy of Holies. It was about 80 feet high and 24 feet wide. Because of its great size, it was very thick and strong and consisted of several layers of drapes. Anything layered like this is virtually impossible to tear by natural means. He continues, The ripping of the curtain would have been seen as devastating, a a horrible thing to the priest. Yet it was a sign of what Jesus had done on the cross. He opened the way to fellowship with God. The barrier was removed because of Christ's ultimate sacrifice on the cross. Our relationship with God changed. The tearing of the curtain was not horrible, It was astonishing in how wonderful it was. I need you to understand a couple things about the temple in Jerusalem. I want you to imagine the temple like a concert hall, a music venue. The parking lot is the place where foreigners stood. That's where you and I had to go to worship. It's kind of like being at JPJ, standing in the parking lot, and we can only hear the bass or the thud in the walls. The women would worship from the very back row. 
The good Jewish men have front row seats. And the priests are on the floor near the stage where they would perform their duties. The stage of the temple was a place called the most holy place. No one got to go in there but one man, one day, a year. The high priest could go into the most highly place. And he went in there literally fearing for his life. I read where they would tie a rope around his ankle just in case he fell dead. They could pull him out. That's how terrified people were of the most holy place because God is said to dwell there. God is holy. God is perfect. God can't be around sinful people. So we have to put this very thick, very dark curtain between God and everybody else. The Bible tells us the moment that Jesus died, that curtain fell. It was ripped in two from top to bottom, meaning that God did it. Now the way to God is open, and anybody can have a relationship with God. The payment for sin has been made in full. The book of John says all that was required for men to be right with God was finished on the cross. Listen to John chapter 19, verse 30. When he had received, meaning Jesus, the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In Mark chapter 15, verse 37, we read, With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. According to the Bible scholars, this loud cry may have been the very last words that John records. It is finished. He spoke it out loud. He declared it for all to hear. He uttered a loud cry to his Father in heaven so the whole world would know and for every sinful force to run away. For Christ's work on the cross was complete, done, accomplished, paid in full, victory over sin and death. If you really want to grasp the significance of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice, Listen to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 20. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. You see, now we have access to God in ways that others have never had access to God before. This is why your Bible has two testaments. This is why there's an old covenant and a new covenant because of the events that transpired on the cross. You see, the cross is not the end. It is just the beginning. And you will hear more next week. It's fascinating to me that the first person focused on in this transaction on the cross is a Roman army officer. So let's replay Luke chapter 23, 46 and 47. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshiped God and said, surely this man was innocent. It's amazing what Luke describes next. He says this hardened warrior, this Roman officer who has watched a lot of executions and seen a lot of men die, watches this whole event unfold. And then the weight of everything that he sees comes crashing down on him. This Roman commander realizes that they just killed an innocent man, murdered an innocent man the Son of God. So what led this battle-hardened soldier to make this proclamation? Perhaps it was several things. The natural phenomena, the darkness, the torn curtain, and the fact that Jesus died after he surrendered his spirit certainly must have made an impact. Maybe it was Jesus' demeanor. Jesus was not angry and cursing others. He seemed to accept his suffering. 
Maybe the guard saw something in the eyes of Jesus. He's unique. He's not like the hardened criminals this man was used to seeing executed. Maybe it was Jesus' words. The Roman officer heard Jesus pray for his accusers. He heard Jesus as he made provisions for his mom. He heard him extend forgiveness to the criminal crucified beside him and for the crowd that mocked him. Now that this Roman Gentile foreigner can be made right with God, anybody can be made right with God. Now that he has access to God, you and I have access to God. All of us. Having seen the response of the Roman officer, it is as if the camera turns around and we see the same moment in time, but from a different camera angle. This time the camera focuses on the town people who have come to watch the execution. These people surely came out because of a, a warped desire for entertainment. Maybe they came out with a sense of curiosity, wondering if this miracle worker, this king of the Jews, was going to do something spectacular to free himself. Instead, they saw the greatest travesty of justice the world has ever seen. They came for sport and left broken by the horror of what had happened. They were convicted by their own sinfulness. And sadly, at that time, they didn't understand the forgiveness that Christ came to offer us. The language that Luke uses today is that the whole crowd went home in deep sorrow because they realized they just killed the Son of God. The guilt and the weight of this is sitting on their shoulders for weeks. Is it any wonder that the book of Acts is Luke's follow-up book? In the book of Acts, we read that Peter, remember Peter denied Jesus three times, stands up to preach on the day of Pentecost, and thousands of people turn from their sins. Many of those people were at the cross when Jesus took his last breath. The weight of what they just did has been sitting on their shoulders for weeks until Peter stands up and tells them how that sin was paid for by Jesus' death on the cross. So what does Jesus' sacrifice mean to you? This is the question that I asked our Spring Hill teenagers, and I want to share some of their responses with you today. Jesus' sacrifice means freedom and forgiveness. He knows I'm not perfect, but I still get to wake up every morning with a second chance to try and follow in his image. Jesus' sacrifice to me means that he can and will do anything both for me and for the world, and with him everything is possible. Jesus' sacrifice means that I was sovereignly chosen by God an amazing act of mercy and grace to be adopted into his family by faith in Jesus' sacrifice. I am now justified before the judge and declared righteous. The Holy Spirit is now working to sanctify me and make me more like Christ. Christ will hold me fast until the end, and then I will be glorified with Christ in heaven and enjoy eternity with him. And let me read one more. Jesus' sacrifice means a lot to me. He gave us a choice, and I have chosen to follow God. He is always with me. But by Jesus dying on the cross, he has now given me another choice when I sin. Do I want to live my life with that sin, or do I want to be forgiven by him? Because of his sacrifice, he, says, he has given me many chances to live a life with him. Though I make mistakes... He still loves and forgives me. Pretty awesome. So now it's your turn. What does Jesus' sacrifice mean to you? Think about it. Will you please join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us so much that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to this world to take our place on the cross. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice, 
for setting us free from sin and granting us eternal life with you in heaven by believing and following you. It is in your precious name we pray. Amen. So we now come to our time of invitation. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, man, we really want to know about it. Please call our office. And again, we're hoping to have a big celebration, a baptism party, and we want you to be a part of it. But if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you have questions, I hope that you listen to this message, that Jesus gave up his life on the cross for all of us. We don't have to be good enough. Our sins are forgiven. We are free. We have access to Christ now. So if you have more questions about what does that really mean, please call our office and set up a time to meet with, with me or Steve, maybe a deacon. We would love to talk more to you about following Christ.
Hey, I just want to say thank you for joining our service today. And before I close us in prayer, again, please remember that when Jesus died on the cross, that he rose again. That is our beginning. And we're going to hear more about that next week. And we hope that you will join us at one of our celebration services next Sunday. I'm going to go ahead and close us in prayer. Again, thank you for joining us today. Our Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you for loving us so much that you sent your Son to this world to forgive us, to give us a second chance. You forgive us of our sins. You show us grace. What a wonderful gift. Jesus, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made on the cross, the suffering that you had to go, for, go through in taking our place. Lord, thank you. We can't thank you enough. Father, help us to follow in the likeness of your Son as we serve others in this community and beyond. Help us to sacrifice ourselves to help others. We thank you for all that you've done for us, and we love you greatly. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.